No one's doing best and worst list this year, right? Just me? Right? Twenty twenty two was something of a cinematic recovery. Following a couple of years of spotty releases thanks to the COVID nineteen pandemic, twenty twenty two leveraged the momentum of last year's late box office hit Spider Man No Way Home to deliver a steady stream of financial and critical successes. At least until around August when everything kind of just dried up for no reason. But hey, at least everything that was left got to come out all at the same time around November, ensuring I'd have nowhere near enough time to see everything I needed to. Thanks a lot. Jerks. I want to see Pinocchio too. The Guillermo del Toro one, not that dog <laughs> that Robert Zemeckis put out this year. You made Back to the Future, dude. What happened? Despite having more than a few blind spots from this year, like a true American, I'm not going to let a moderate case of ignorance prevent me from developing my own top and bottom five of the year list, plus an honorable mention or two. So without further ado, let's get into it. The Nerd on Films Quality and Crap of 2022! Two! Two! two. Two. Sorry, I'll stop. Let's begin with my pick for the most overrated film of the year, followed by my picks for the absolute worst of 2022. Most overrated. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Make no mistake, I think Everything, Everywhere, All at Once is a good movie. Scratch that. I think it's a really good movie. I gave it a favorable review here on my channel and a positive review over on Letterboxd. Michelle Yeoh is bae. I love seeing Ki Hoi Kwan, short round himself, back on the big screen. And the film featured some of the most original and bizarre ideas I've ever seen put to screen. In short, it's a film that deserves a lot of the positive attention it's getting. But I say this with all due respect, y'all out here act like it's the second coming of Christ or something. I had a good time with everything, everywhere, all at once, but I'd be lying if I said I thought about it much after it was over. The film's stabs at profundity are quite as mind-blowing as everyone seems to think they are, and while I admire the Daniels and their inventiveness, they don't know when to relax. The film is so in your face all the time that by the end I was just exhausted, and not necessarily in the best way. On top of that, everything was just so damn twee that my hipster spider sense wouldn't shut off throughout the movie. This thing feels like it was written in a trendy coffee shop by a guy who got there on his old timey bike who couldn't stop twisting his scraggly mustache while pounding away on a steam powered typewriter. We get it. You're clever. You don't have to try so hard to prove it. Dishonorable mention, Darren Aronofsky's The Whale. There was a time back in the day when Darren Aronofsky was one of my favorite directors. The dude's style is bold and utterly unique, and for a long time it seemed like he just couldn't miss. I mean, Pie, Requiem for a Dream, The Fountain, The Wrestler, Black Swan. This mother don't miss. No, he's good. That mother don't miss, man. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, he did. He just missed. Now, I never finished 2014's Noah, so I can't judge it, but after getting through the first 20 minutes, I shut it off and never felt the need to go back. That's fine enough, that one's on me. But Aronofsky followed that one up with the absolute worst film of 2017, Mother. Pronounced Mother because of the ridiculous exclamation point in the title. By the way, stop it with the exclamation points, people. You abuse them. Mother was a film that had nothing new to say about anything, and it went about saying it in the most obnoxious and punishing way possible, a quality it shares with my pick for the worst film of the year this year, but we'll get to that later. And now Aronofsky's released yet another film in the same vein, The Whale. While Brendan Fraser's performance at the center of this movie is quite good, the script he's saddled with is melodramatic to the point of unintentional hilarity, and his co-star Sadie Sink is quite simply atrocious. Don't get me wrong, I think Sadie Sink is a good actress. I thought she was fantastic in the latest season of Stranger Things, but like the entire cast of Mother, it's clear that she was directed to hit one note and one note only throughout the entirety of the film, and the result is one of the most unlikable characters I've ever seen put to the big screen. Combine that with a selfish protagonist the film attempts to paint as noble, and you get yet another disappointing effort from a formerly great director. Number 5, Clerks 3. Speaking of directors letting me down, Clerks 3 was supposed to be Kevin Smith's return to form following, well, following every film he's released since Clerks 2 back in 2006. It was supposed to be the epic conclusion to the lighthearted feel-good series that launched his career, featuring his unique brand of vulgarity, pop culture awareness, and heart. Instead, it's a tired and bleak recitation of material Smith has covered ad nauseum in his films, podcasts, and speaking engagements, where the core thesis seems to be that your life is going to end, so you might as well give up now, asshole. Ah. Uh. Nothing like ending your heartwarming comedy trilogy with a heaping dose of crushing nihilism. 
Smith delivers this thesis as lazily as possible, giving us his traditional static camera angles, pop culture references that are tired and crowbarred in at any cost, and a truly horrendous performance from Brian O'Halloran that reaches for a deep emotional truth but ends up feeling grating and forced. Clerks 3 was so bad it's perplexing. Why on earth would you end this series this way? Number 4. Morbius. I gotta be honest. I hesitated to put Morbius on this list at all. It gave us so many great things this year. It showed us just how out of touch Sony is with the public's reception to their films when they confused everyone's ironic appreciation for the movie as genuine, re-releasing it in theaters after its run so it could flop again. It gave us a steady stream of Morbin time memes that I found endlessly amusing, including one from famous cult leader, the man himself, Jared Leto. What are you reading? Uh, nothing. Nothing really. Just, uh, I don't know. What are you reading? Nothing. And it gave us an infamous dance sequence featuring Doctor Who encouraging everyone to, and I quote, Have sex! Have sex! Despite all of that silver lining, if we look at Morbius on its own merits, we're left with what can only be described as a tired throwback to the comic book films of yore. Think Tim Story's Fantastic Four as opposed to Brian Singer's X-Men. It's a bloodless PG-13 vampire film that lacks any notable violence, features some truly brain-dead moments, including Dr. Michael Morbius being shocked at his co-worker, discovering his illegal horde of vampire bats that he's cleverly hidden in a clear ceiling-length tube at the center of his lab, and gives us a performance from infamous weirdo Jared Leto Boof. where he absolutely plays it straight for some reason you're playing a living vampire man get weird with it go full del toro Everything about Morbius is bizarre yet sanitized, and it's yet another clear example of how Sony shouldn't be allowed to get away with their abuse of the Spider-Man license. Can't wait for El Muerto starring famous non-actor Bad Bunny later next year. Number 3. Moonfall Moonfall almost shouldn't be on this list just because of how forgettable it is. Roland Emmerich has been making the same disaster movie over and over again for years, so this one being awful wasn't exactly a surprise, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't impressed by just how dumb it is. You'd think a film about the moon crashing into the earth would be pretty straightforward. Maybe like a comet hits it and knocks it off its axis or something. I don't know. No one's paying me to write this, so I can't think too hard about it. But Emmerich and his co-writers, oh god, it took several people to write this movie, introduce all of this complex lore about a forerunner race and rogue AI that the film becomes as convoluted as it is stupid. There is some fun to be had with just how hard the criminally underrated Patrick Wilson tries to sell everything, and I did cackle out loud every time the moon, a massive celestial body, would suddenly pop up over the horizon like a killer in a slasher movie. Jeez, it's the moon! And I do have to admit the sheer gall of the blatant product placement for Lexus was pretty impressive. All right, let me put this baby in the warp speed. Go, go! You know what? Never mind. I liked Moonfall. Number two, the 355. If you've been watching my channel even a little bit, then you know I love a good spy movie. I think James Bond is the greatest cinematic creation of all time. I love every entry in the Bourne franchise. Yes, even Bourne Legacy. And I honestly think Christopher McQuarrie's Mission Impossible Fallout is the greatest action movie of all time. Say what you want about Tom Cruise. The dude knows how to make a movie. So it goes without saying that I was extremely interested in the 355, an all-female spy movie starring some of the best actresses working today. Jessica Chastain, Lupita Nyong'o, Diane Kruger. What could go wrong? Two words. Simon Kinberg. Kinberg, a writer who's written mostly crap, has fairly recently decided to become a writer-director who directs mostly crap. He must have gotten tired of ruining comic book movies after the atrocious X-Men Dark Phoenix because he turned his attention to the spy genre with this film. He doesn't offer a single trace of originality at any point during the movie, delivering action sequences straight out of Taken and a generic plot stolen from countless other spy movies. And he attempts to make all of this unexceptional boilerplate garbage palatable by shamelessly pandering to a female audience who he also kind of undermines. Sebastian Stan is the villain of the film, and there are several moments where these extremely capable women, who have killed a number of people, are helpless to stop him for seemingly no reason. I know I'm only a repugnant cog of the male patriarchy, but I always thought the point of these films was to empower women, not make them look helpless. This entire cast deserved better. Number one, men. I can't emphasize this enough. Men comes in at number one on this list by a country mile. Sorry, 
an English country mile. Not only is it the worst film I've seen all year, but it's the worst film I've seen since Darren Aronofsky's Mother back in 2017. I'm usually a huge fan of Garland, and much like Aronofsky, prior to this, he was on a nearly unparalleled creative hot streak. This man wrote two of my favorite Danny Boyle movies, 28 Days Later and Sunshine. He wrote and ghost directed the better than it had any right to be dread. Nowhere near enough if you supported that flick, by the way. And he wrote and directed the excellent Ex Machina and the best film of 2018, Annihilation. Prior to watching Men, I only saw the poster and a single opaque trailer that gave little to nothing away about the movie, which was more than enough to get me in the theater, but did nothing to prevent me from figuring out every single narrative turn the film had in store long before the movie ever got going. Garland presents the film as if he's got something new or groundbreaking to say about sexual politics, but the film's themes are as deep as a puddle and about as original as a 355. Men are pathetic, needy, and stupid, and women will unfortunately have to deal with it for the foreseeable future. Though mostly accurate, it's not a new idea, and Garland presents it in the most repugnant way possible, forcing his audience to watch a pregnant demon in the form of Rory Kinnear, the guy who f***ed a pig on that one episode of Black Mirror, give birth to different forms of his own self, not once, not twice, but at least four times, as slowly, agonizingly, and as pretentiously as possible. I would insert some overlay footage, but there's no way in hell I'm ever looking at that again. I feel so bad for every CGI artist that worked on this movie. Men is a truly awful film, and if you like yourself even a little bit, you'll stay far, far away from it. With all that negativity out of the way, let's turn that frown upside down and jump into my picks for the best films of the year, starting with my honorable mention. Honorable mention, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Despite a better than average score on Rotten Tomatoes, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness seems to have a generally lukewarm reputation that I don't fully understand. I loved this movie, and despite director Sam Raimi hurting me so bad with Spider-Man 3, I was happy to see him return to the big screen in a genre he helped define. Raimi's Spider-Man 2 stands to this day as one of the greatest comic book films ever made, and though Multiverse of Madness isn't in the same league, it's still a hell of a lot of fun. It's the rare MCU film with an auteurist vision, though Raimi restrains himself for the first half of the movie. But around the time Benedict Cumberbatch's Doctor Strange possesses his own dead body, the director is allowed to go full Raimi, filling the movie with crazy whip pans, Dutch angles, and B-movie makeup effects. Sure, the way the film stops in the middle to dump a bunch of exposition and fan service is more than a bit clunky, but if you can look into my eyes, the windows to my soul, and tell me that seeing John Krasinski as Reed Richards and Patrick Stewart as Professor Professor X wasn't awesome, you're a damn liar. For my money, Benedict Cumberbatch is quickly on the way to supplanting Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark as the new heart and soul of the MCU, and I don't think the movie gets enough credit for the big swing it took with Elizabeth Olsen's Wanda Maximoff, positioning her as the villain of the film. A character progression that, despite fan outcry, completely makes sense. I'm sorry, but if you didn't see it coming, you weren't paying attention. What did you think WandaVision was about? Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness was an utter blast that just misses out on my top five. Number five, Star Wars, er, uh, Top Gun Maverick. I'm relatively new when it comes to the Top Gun train, er, jet, having only seen the original last year in anticipation of its sequel, a sequel that was delayed a whole nother year, but hey, at least we have it now. Thankfully, like the similarly delayed Bond film No Time to Die, Top Gun Maverick was well worth the wait. This film is a masterclass in old school filmmaking as well as new school innovation, using thousands of hours of practical aerial photography to top the original on a visceral level while utilizing a script that recaptures its cheesy essence. The movie introduces an A-plot that feels like it was ripped right out of a Mission Impossible movie, thanks Christopher McQuarrie, and a climax that shamelessly rips off the Death Star trench run from Star Wars A New Hope. Hey. If you're gonna steal, steal from the best. Tom Cruise remains on top of his game, and his supporting cast is incredibly likable. The ones that actually get to be characters, that is. Like Mad Max Fury Road or Blade Runner 2049 before it, Top Gun Maverick is everything you could want in a legacy sequel, and will hopefully serve as a benchmark for action films going forward. Let's see less green screen and more high-profile celebrities with death wishes risking their necks. Number 4. The Fablemans Steven Spielberg has never been one of my personal favorite directors. I mean, the Indiana Jones series is life, but I can take or leave a lot of his other stuff. Yet there's no denying he's a master filmmaker. He is to cinema what Mario is to kart racing. He's not the best at any one thing, but he is the best all around. Yes, I just compared the career of one of our greatest living directors to a Nintendo mascot in a go-kart.
Last year, he delivered one of the best films of 2021 with his remake of West Side Story, and he's done it yet again this year with the deeply personal, fictionalized account of his youth, The Fablemans. The film serves as a warm love letter to art, specifically cinema, and it paints a complicated and empathetic portrait of his parents that doesn't shy away from the less wholesome elements of their lives. Well, of his mom's life, at least. His dad was practically a saint. Michelle Williams continues to prove she's one of the greatest actresses currently working as Sammy Fableman's mother Mitzi, and Paul Dano delivers his best performance of the year, and one of the best of his career as his father, Bert. I was unfamiliar with Gabriel LaBelle, the actor who serves as Spielberg's stand-in Sammy, but he holds his own against a pair of veteran actors while carrying a movie about the very person who is directing him. Which has to be awkward. I suspected I'd like The Fablemans, but I never thought I'd end up loving it, yet the movie hasn't left my mind since I saw it, something it has in common with the top films on this list. Number 3. Turning Red Turning Red charmed the pants right off me. Uh, metaphorically. Please don't report me. It takes place in the glory days of 2002 and utterly nails a time period ruled by boy bands and Tamagotchi. While I obviously didn't live the exact same experience as the tween girls this film follows, I did know tween girls just like the ones this film follows. Well, from a distance. Not like that. Please don't report me. The film's protagonist, Mai Lin Lee, as voiced by actress Rosalie Chiang, is utterly charming, the animation is top-notch, and the original songs written by Billie Eilish and her brother Phineas, that are performed by fictional boy band Fortown, which of course features five members, are legit bangers that are also hilarious pastiches of the pop music of the time. Most daringly, however, is the fact that the film is a not-so-subtle metaphor for puberty, one the filmmakers don't shy away from. I never thought I'd see a Pixar movie where someone's mom exclaims about tampons but here we are. If that wasn't enough, the film also borrows some stylistic cues from Edgar Wright's fantastic Scott Pilgrim and culminates in an out-of-left-field kaiju battle that's resolved through the power of familial love and music. Turning Red is an incredibly special movie, and it's a crime that was relegated to Disney Plus and not on the big screen. But hey, it's still on there, so if you haven't seen it yet, get on it. And remember, don't report me. Number 2. Glass Onion Glass Onion made me anxious. I'm a diehard fan of director Ryan Johnson, and the first film in this series, Knives Out, was as close to perfection as a movie can get. I've watched it more than a few times, and I find something new every time. That said, following up on perfection is never an easy task, and nothing can tarnish a good film more than an underwhelming sequel. I hate to say another unkind word about Sam Raimi, but watching Spider-Man 2 is a little bittersweet when you know it's coming next. Thankfully, Johnson hits the mark with Glass Onion, a sequel that's not quite as good as the original, but still manages to recapture the elements that made it work, just on a bigger scale. And it's that scale that provides half the fun of the movie. Knowing how much Johnson and crew were paid by Netflix to make this film and its upcoming sequel, I really got a kick out of the unnecessary extravagance and needless cameos. I won't spoil who pops up here, but I will say the prestige actor that makes an appearance on the docks near the beginning of the film for a role that could have easily been filled by a faceless extra made me cackle. Daniel Craig continues to be a straight G as Benoit Blanc, and I think there's an argument to be made that the extended cast is potentially one of the greatest ever assembled. The film's shockingly topical, and the way Johnson is able to subvert expectations several times is nothing less than masterful. It's a feature, not a bug people. Glass Onion is everything one could possibly want in a sequel. I can only hope the third installment will be half as good. Number 1. The Batman Despite being somewhat lukewarm on the Batman initially, the film's grown in my esteem more and more since I've seen it. And that's saying something since I literally haven't been able to watch it since it left theaters. I know it's on HBO Max, but I generally don't have three hours in a day to blow. So yeah, the movie's far too long. I maintain that you could cut out more than half of the Catwoman subplot. It retreads a lot of the ground Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy already thoroughly covered. Nolan did Batman Year One, so we'll do Year Two! It's bulletproof! And the Joker-Riddler scene at the end of the film rivals the Morbius post-credits for the worst and most unnecessary franchise setup of the year. I love the Joker as much as everybody else, but uh, we did it already. Like nine times. We already did it. It took seven hours, but we did it. It's done! That said, all of those complaints about the movie tend to fade away whenever I think about this... ...or this... Or that. 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing quite like watching Batman punch crime in its turkey neck, and the Batman delivers that in spades. Robert Pattinson and director Matt Reeves seemingly don't have any interest in the Bruce Wayne half of the Batman equation, and as a result, Pattinson is in the suit for the majority of the film's runtime. That's saying something. Again, it's a long-ass movie. While Nolan did explore the detective aspect of Batman a bit, the Batman models itself after David Fincher's Seven, giving us a detective movie where the detective just happens to wear a bulletproof bat costume. Though several other actors have worn said bulletproof bat costume, Robert Pattinson still manages to find his own way into the character, crafting a moody protagonist who's just kind of off. A take that seems obvious, but it's also one that no other actor has really gone for. Keaton played it neurotic, but could at least pretend tend to be well adjusted. This Batman either can't or doesn't care to. The film looks fantastic thanks to Dune cinematographer Grieg Fraser, and it makes the best use of a volume stage that I've seen to date. I liked Thor Love and Thunder well enough, but compare those volume sets to the ones on the Batman and it's no contest. In a lot of ways, the Batman is the kind of Batman movie I wanted my whole life, and at the time of its release, I was just too hung up on the Nolan trilogy to see it. Batman Begins is still the greatest Batman movie of all time, but this is a comfortable second. I'm just glad I realized my mistake by the end of the year. So there you have it, folks, my five best and worst films of the year. Let me know what you think of the list, and let me know your picks down in the comments section below. I'd also like to ask that if you liked this video, please hit the like button, and please press subscribe. I'd like to say thanks in advance, thanks for watching, and until next time, peace.